So you guys, um, last night Kevin walked in and it was getting late and I was on the bedroom floor spread out with a laptop and a Bible um, and Kevin said, what in the world are you doing? Um, that's not my normal routine on a Saturday night. And um, he goes, wait a minute, I think I know you're completely redoing a sermon, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I am. Um, I had been kind of hearing those whispers this week um, because as the hurricane approached, I knew one of the questions that kind of folded in, we're in a series about frequently avoided questions. And one of the questions I get a lot uh, just in the years of ministry I've had concerns natural disasters. And so I was hearing those whispers and then as the hurricane struck and then especially last night as we saw what's beginning to happen in Houston and many of us have family there. I know I met people even out in the community who have homes or relatives in Corpus Christi or they have businesses or this touches us. And I realized I needed to go ahead and wait on the message I was going to give today and we'll get to that in two weeks um, and just talk about why it is that natural disasters occur. And then how can we be people of faith within them? So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then let's get into this question. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. We invite you into each of our hearts. Uh, we are in the midst of a natural disaster. We are in the midst of a time when people in our community, we don't know how much flooding will happen, and certainly we know that there are people we love who are in flooded areas right now. And so we do pray, Lord, not only that you be with us, Holy Spirit, to help us understand why, but you be with them. Uh, be with our children, be with our families, be with our friends, uh, homes that we've left behind. We pray that you be with first, first responders, those people who go directly into the disasters the rest of us are trying to get out. We pray that you would help them to use their skills, that you keep them safe, and may they be able to save lives, Lord. We pray for the weakest, for the children and the sick, and those who are elderly, that you would put strong arms around them and you would help keep them safe. And Lord, we just pray that you would be with us. And for as long as we are okay and doing well, that you would give us the strength to help others as we can. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this, this question, um, where do natural disasters come from? And and then how do we respond to them? I've heard a lot of bad answers to this question. And maybe you have too. I, I will never forget after Hurricane Katrina hit, and I was already in ministry when that happened, and all the way up in San Angelo, we had um, refugees coming to San Angelo. And it was at that time, right after that, that some of the bad answers, because you ask, well, why did this happen? Why, why this suffering? And and I remember Pat Robertson, do y'all remember this, said, yep, um, well, it's because of the sin of that town, that God did this, okay? Now, let me just tell you, that is rubbish, okay? So before we go any further, that's rubbish. We need an answer better than that. And when people say things like that, I need you to be ready with the true, real answer of why these bad things happen, okay? Or even if not the answer, because sometimes you don't need an answer when something bad is going on. You just need somebody to be there with you. But I need you to be able to tell truth from fiction. And Pat Robertson, that was just out and out rubbish. That was a lie. Now, here's what he said. He said that God was punishing the sin of the gambling community and some of the other things in New Orleans. Okay, Pat. Who was it that escaped from Hurricane Katrina? Who was able to get out? Was, wasn't it the owners of the casinos that were able to fly their private jets or drive whatever it was they were driving away from the disaster when it struck? And who was it that was left? It was the poor. It was children whose parents said, we're going to ride this out. It was the elderly and who is it throughout the Bible that God is always saying that he cares about and that we should care about? It's those people, the least and the last and the lost and the elderly and the children. And so to say that natural disasters are a punishment for some kind of sin is just wrong. So we need a better answer 
than that. And that's what I want to go about um, helping us with today and then helping, well, then how do we respond? So we've talked in this series. My husband actually said, and I can go a little bit off because I've written this last night. My husband said, Laura, isn't it interesting that all these major questions that the church has had in 2017, you're always going to the first couple of chapters in Genesis? He said, it's almost as if God knew these were our heart questions. And so right there at the beginning are the answers. That's cool to think about, isn't it? So we're going back to Genesis, okay? So we we talked about creation. And the first, the very first week of this series, I showed you how there's this beautiful structure in creation where um, different things fill different days. And at the very pinnacle of that is humanity. And God says to us, watch over this for me. And then at the top of that above us is God, okay? Now into this beautiful creation, and let's think about how beautiful it was. What does God say at the end of every day in creation? It's good, right? It's good. So we hear that over and over so that our ears will tune in. Creation as God gave it to us is good, 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 very good right? Perfect. There's no disease. There is no death. There's not a single weed on the ground. Can y'all imagine a world like that? No tears and no crying. And that is the world that God gives to humanity and says, now you take care of it. Now we know that there was also, we've talked about that God gave us another gift. It's a wonderful gift, but It's a dangerous gift. God gave us the gift of choice, of being truly free. And so we can truly choose to love God or we can truly choose to absolutely turn away from God and even go against God's will. So in this beautiful, good, good, very good creation, God puts us, gives us this power to choose and says, okay, eat anything. Anything you want, look around, it's yours, it's all good and amazing, there's food for a lifetime here, you take care of it, but that tree over there will kill you. Do not eat it, it will destroy you. It's the knowledge of good and evil, you don't need it. Well, humanity course is enticed by that tree and the man and the woman eventually eat the fruit of it. Now I've I've had some of y'all say and again I can take a pause to address this here well that's not really fair that was them right we kind of feel that like why should we suffer because of their bad choice okay but then we have to ask ourselves who here among us has invariably chosen the good We are part of this, right? This is a story about humanity and about how we abuse our free will and about how our choices can lead to death and hurt. And the hurt that we see being poured out into the world from this choice is in three places. First of all, the relationship between God and people is broken. And so remember or know that there was this time in creation before the people chose sin that every night at the end of the day, during the time of the evening breezes, Genesis says, God would walk with the people. So there's this tender, intimate parent and child, hold my hand and let's enjoy the best part of the day kind of a relationship. And yet as soon as our spiritual ancestors choose sin, they begin to hide from God and be afraid that God is angry and displeased because they have gone against God. So there's this brokenness in our relationship with God. It's not free and open and unpolluted anymore. There's also brokenness in our relationship with each other. Before, the man, when he had seen the woman, he said, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. They love each other. There's nothing in between them. They, They love each other. And then they take a bite of sin. And suddenly, not only are they they ashamed in front of each other, but they're blaming each other, aren't they? When God does seek them out and find them and says, what has happened? 
you know, Eve points her finger at the serpent, Adam points his finger at Eve. I mean, they're blaming, trying to shift. And so there's this brokenness in between us and other people. But finally, and this is the part we need to remember for today, creation is broken by humanity's sin. And this is when weeds spring up and the ground suffers under a curse that it didn't want and the good earth is corrupted and Eden is lost. Now, when we look at this, and we'll get more into this when we talk about how bad things happen to good people, Jesus restores two of these, right? Our relationship with God is now free and open, and the barriers between us and other people can come down. We see that in the early church, but what remains? Creation is still broken and will only be fully restored when Jesus returns. So here we are, friends, redeemed people who can be transformed in our relationship with God, who can be set free in our relationship with others who are still living in a world that is broken. Okay, a world where there are hurricanes and there are fires and there are mudslides and there are people who abuse their free will too. And we're waiting for that day when Jesus returns and we get Eden back, but we're not there yet. So... Um, I want to read to you from Romans just to, because this verse really helps me about how we're not home yet. This is what Paul says. He says, all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children, see, because we're there, it will join God's children in glorious freedom from decay and death. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. Creation is groaning. And when we see a hurricane that floods and destroys and takes life, that's just our broken world that we're living in. So if disasters are a consequence then of living in our broken world, then how do we live as redeemed people in a world that is still longing for that day of redemption? I have a couple of ideas. Um, First, see, what Pat Robertson did is he went to blame somebody. I find that the redemptive way to address a catastrophe of any kind is not to point our fingers at someone, but to, to look within ourselves. Okay, to do some soul searching, to turn our faces to God and say, who do you need me to be in this moment? This terrible thing has happened to me. What do you have next for me? Or how can I help? Um, and one of the things that we see when disasters strike is it can really get us down to the core of what matters in life. I don't know how many of y'all were here, living here, when the fires struck. Um, But I was here when the fire struck, and many of you were. And 29 homes were consumed in our community just across the river. And I remember going out to minister to people at the gas station up here and being up at the church, and then some of the firefighters who knew I was here, they said, okay, pastor, but you need to go home and make sure that you have, you know, your boxes packed of whatever it is you're going to save because it's coming over the river towards your house. And so I'll never forget going home and telling Kevin, okay, get the kids and make sure that, you know, we get the main things. Did did any of y'all have to do this? What Decide what the main things of life are? That if the fire comes, I'm going to save this? You know, picture books and the hard drive, Kevin grabbed the hard drive and it's all in a box in the middle of our floor and um, then I went back out. And just that exercise of, okay, what are the main things in my life? Well, it turns out the main things in my life are not actually things. They're my kids and my husband. They're people and as long as those people are okay, then I'm okay. Okay. 
And even when I would see people in our church who had lost everything, as long as they were okay, that's what mattered to me. So when we're in the heart of a disaster, it can be a chance for us to just kind of get down to the core of what is it in my life that's eternal? And hold on to that. So we're going to hold on with everything we have to our relationship with God because nobody can take that from us. No flood can wash that away. No fire can burn it up. And we're going to hold on with everything we have to the people in our lives. And you guys, we know as believers that even death won't ultimately separate us from the people we love. There's more. So we're going to hold on to the people while we have them, and we're going to still know a day is coming even when we lose somebody where we'll be reunited. That's the first thing is soul searching and getting down to that core of what's internal and what's in, what endures. This world isn't it, and our stuff isn't it. But man, our relationship with God and the people we love, we're going to hold on to that. The next thing is I think about what Elijah did. Elijah was a prophet of God, and he was a mighty man of God, and he had seen amazing miracles, but there came a point in his life, and this is in 1 Kings 19, where he was worn out. He had been threatened one too many times, and he just felt like this was, this was the last thing he could take, and he ran to God. So in that time, he went to Mount Sinai, and he ran to God. And he told him about his hurt. And God said to him this, Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. So he's going to wait for the Lord. Many of you may know this story. As Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. See, when we're in the midst of a natural disaster, I think we might think we're listening for God in the howling of the wind or in the flood or in the fire. And God's not in the fire or the flood or the wind. God is the whisper that comes after. That we have to be listening for, that then we can go out. The one whispering to us, my child, right? The sound of a gentle whisper, calling his name, right? Calling your name and my name. Come out and meet me. And God asked Elijah, Elijah a question that, um, that I love. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And for years I read that as, come on, get back to work. What are you doing here? You know, you're wrong. But as I've grown up, I read it more as a loving father might say, what are you doing here? What is it you need? And most of all, that heart question, that core thing of, What is it I put you here to do? You know, in the midst of this dark time in your life, in the midst of these storms, who are you called to be? What is it you are doing here? And Elijah says, I have zealously served the Lord my God. What are you doing here? Elijah says, I've been your servant. That's who I'm called to be, but I'm worn out, God. And I need some help. And so God gives him a helper. God gives him a partner in ministry so he can go on and keep doing what God has called him to do. And God gives him a new ruler to anoint and just all of these helps so that he can continue in who he is for God. And so the second thing I think of is when I think about disasters, we need to seek God. Listen for his voice and, and hear that call to each of us. What are you doing here? 
You know, what help can I give you? And then what purpose is it that God has placed in your hand? What area of the world is under your care? What can you be doing when the wind and the fire and the earthquake has passed? And I think about that because I see that all the time. I was sitting in the 930 service and there was a family on the second row whose house had burned to the ground in the fire. And I looked at them and I realized that when they listened for the Lord in that moment, even though they had lost everything, their home became one of the hubs for their community. That burned down shell of a home, they heard that call and they would comfort people and people would just come to their home, the remains of their home, what are we going to do? And they'd say, okay, well, we're getting this and we're getting that and you're going to be okay. And then after that fire, they heard the whisper of God and they responded. And I know there's others of you. We had, we had a group, one of them's over there, Judy's over there, that called themselves the church ladies. And after the fire, they would just go out week after week for a year to just love people because that was the area of the world that God had given them. And I know that many of you, when you saw that there are elderly people coming, you got food ready for the ones who are going to take care of them. You opened up your homes to relatives or friends coming in from the damaged areas. I know I'm going to see you in the days when the wind has died down and the storm is gone. You're going to be there whispering to people, hey, God is here. It's not the end yet. It's not the end. There can come a new day. The sun is going to come out and I'm going to help you. And so I think when we find ourselves and it's raining but we're okay, then we, then we listen for God's voice and we hear that call, what are you doing here? We say, oh, right. I'm here to change the world. I'm here to take care of this, this area of responsibility that you've given to me. We are here for that. And God has us at Bee Creek. And so this area of the world and this area of Texas, it's going to be a little bit better and maybe a lot better because of us. Because we're listening to that whisper. So what are you doing here? What are you doing here? When you hear God's whisper, and I pray that you already are, may you answer like Elijah did. I'm here to zealously serve the Lord. Let's pray. God, you know that we have children out on cruise ships and family in areas where homes are being ripped apart. We have people who in this congregation will be on the front lines of the response driving into the disaster and it feels like so little what we can bring. But you whisper to us that one life can make a difference. And so I pray, God, that you would give us what we need. Give us our Elijahs to help us. Give us partners on this journey. Help us to stand together. And go with us into this broken world as people who know the core of what lasts, that you last, and those we love that last. And help us to be rebuilders, to be bringers of hope to be people who help others hear your whisper even when the storms of life roar. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.